Hello, happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. We are here in Pennsylvania and we will be reading a beautiful and important essay called Crossing the Threshold by Charles Eisenstein. So we're going to trade off reading this beautiful essay aloud while we walk on this magnificently beautiful day. So please enjoy this essay by Charles Eisenstein. For a few decades now, it seems, humanity has been on the verge of a breakthrough in collective consciousness. Perhaps it was the hippies in the 60s who saw it first. To them, it was crystal clear that the consciousness revolution would sweep all before it, that within a few years' time, such institutions as government, money, marriage, and school would become obsolete. Forty years later, their vision has not come to pass, and, superficially at least, the defining institutions of our civilization are more powerful, more encompassing than ever. Nonetheless, to many of us, much of the time, and to most of us at least once in a while, the breakthrough in consciousness the hippies foretold seems imminent still. Perhaps it seems imminent because, in those peak experiences when we know the true potential of our humanity, the true vastness of our minds, and the love that is the default state of existence, it seems so obvious that we have returned to our birthright and recovered our original estate. It could be a near-death experience that brings us there, a psychedelic experience, a moment in nature, giving birth, making love, it could be a religious experience, or come through a dream, music, or meditation. It can also be awakened through psychological work, a transformational seminar, even a book. Usually, though, the high does not last. I've had many such experiences where I think nothing will ever be the same again. But after a few days or weeks, I noticed that I must struggle to maintain the realized state I'd, begin, I'd been in. What was once effortless and self-evident becomes the subject of reminders and practices. The old normal encroaches until I am back where I started and the state that I had felt so true and obvious becomes a mere memory. I can try to repeat the experience but as with the drug, the second high is a little less intense than the first, and the return to baseline is more rapid. Eventually, I come to doubt. Maybe the experience was a drug, an excursion away from reality, and not, as I'd believed, something more real than the world I've come to accept. For some people, that voice swells in volume until it becomes a deafening tumult of despair. Before the experience, there was at least hope. But having entered paradise and been ejected, what is there now to live for? So it was on a cultural level that after the enlightenment and exuberant expectations of the 60s, much of the counterculture turned to the hedonism and consumption of the me decade. What a sense of betrayal we felt as the psychedelic revolution gave way to the war on drugs, as the Clean Air Act gave way to Ronald Reagan and James Watt. Happily, whether on a personal or collective level, the despair can never be complete. For the ember of the awakening experience lives on inextinguishable in yeah. our hearts yes it does however deep the despair to which we may, may descend we carry a first-hand knowledge written into our cells that there is more than just this even if we know not how to return to that more beautiful world we know it exists this knowledge lives independently of beliefs underneath the currents of reason and doubt and impervious to them. 
We cannot cultivate or practice that knowledge, but it cultivates and practices us. The first thing it does is to prevent us from wholeheartedly participating in the old normal. We can do our best to participate in the program. We can go through the motions, but deep down we know that it isn't the real thing. The effort to direct life energy at goals unworthy of our knowledge is exhausting. Eventually, our reservoirs of health and luck are depleted and we enter a state of crisis. Whether it is health, relationship, money, or work related, the crisis is a birthing from the old normal. We cannot go back, yet neither do we know how to go forward. This is a special state, the threshold between worlds. Many of us are there right now, individually. The collective body and the collective human body is approaching it as well. The purpose of this essay is to describe a paradigm of mutual care that can carry us across the threshold between worlds. We did glimpse a more beautiful world in the 1960s, but the, nor the old normal wasn't finished yet. The story had not yet been told to its fullness. Therefore, we could not abide in the new reality. The pull of the old world was too strong. To be sure, there were many individual ex exceptions. To this day, there are unregenerate hippies living in the interstices of our realm, as invisible to us as the Taoist immortals of legend, holding the template of the next world until such time we, as we are ready for it. But for the most part, after the 60s, people returned to the world they left behind and followed it indeed to new extremes. Forty years later, that world is falling apart at an accelerating rate. The stories that undergird our civilization are crumbling. Two are primary, the story of the self and the story of the people. The first is the discrete, separate self, a Cartesian moat of consciousness looking out onto an objective universe of soulless masses and impersonal deterministic forces. In biology, the separate self manifests as the paradigm of the selfish gene seeking to maximize its reproductive self-interest. In economics, it is homo economicus who seeks to, to maximize rational self-interest as measured by money. In psychology, it is the skin encapsulated ego. In religion, the soul encased in flesh but separate from it. Such a self is naturally in opposition to all other beings, whose interests are indifferent to or at odds with its own. Spiritual teachings based on this story of self then tell us we must try very hard to rise above nature, to conquer our biological and economic drive to maximize self-interest at the expense of other beings. Externalized, this war against the self manifests as the second defining story of, of our civilization, the story of the people that I call ascent that says that humanity's destiny is to overcome and transcend nature. It perfectly complements the story of the self, elevating the mental over the physical, the ideal over the concrete, and the spirit over the body. In describing these myths, I use the word story in a special sense, as an unconscious narrative that makes meaning of the world that assigns roles to human beings, 
that explains the nature of life, the world, and the purpose of human existence, and also that coordinates human activity. Stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We are approaching the end of ours, of the stories which our civilization is built. To the extent that those stories are no longer true for you, you do not feel like a full, participate, full, full participant in this civilization. They are becoming untrue for more and more of us as the world built on them falls apart. How can we believe in the conquest of nature when because of our actions the ecological basis of civilization is threatened? How can we believe any more that the final triumph over disease is just around the corner, or an age of leisure or space vacations, or a perfectly just society, if only we extend the realm of control just a bit further? And how can we believe any longer in the paradise of the separate self, independent of all, beholden to no one, financially secure, when we see, the fir when we f see firsthand the alienation, the despair, the starvation for community that makes that paradise a hell? When depression, addiction, suicide, and family breakdown strike even the winners of the war of all against all. Whether on a personal or collective level, we are discovering that the stories of separation are untrue. What we do unto the other inescapably visits ourselves as well in some form. As that becomes increasingly obvious, a new story of self and story of the people becomes accessible to us. I have written, Charles Eisenstein has written, of these in other essays, among them, Money and the Turning of the Age, Rituals for Lover, Lover Earth, Obesity and the Ecology of Health, and in greater depth in his book, The Ascent of Humanity. Which is awesome. <laughs> Read it. The new story of self is the connected self, the self of interbeingness. The new story of the people is one of co-creative partnership with Lover Earth. They ring true in our hearts. We see them on the horizon, but we do not yet live in these new stories. It is hard to when the institutions and habits of the old world still surround us. Poised as we are at the transition between worlds and traveling, many of us, back and forth between them, we need a way to enter the new one, learn to live in it, and be able to abide there. We need, in other words, a midwife. The birth metaphor is perhaps imperfect since we are undergoing not a single final expulsion but a series of brief experiences of a more radiant world in which we have been unable to stay. How can we stay? How can we fully establish ourselves in a radically different way of thinking, relating, and being. Yes, and we will finish that question in part two of the reading of this essay. Thanks so, for watching. Thank you for watching. Please share any comments or questions you have. We'll post a link to the actual essay, which has an alternative title, but we like this title. Um, so thank you and have a beautiful day. Much love. We are all crossing the threshold together. We Amen. all need each other and depend on each other. Mm -hmm. So have a beautiful day. Indeed. Peace.